Hi everybody, thanks so much for dropping by. I really hope you like today's creepy stories. My name is Jane and my husband is Walter. Back in 1995, my husband and I were both in our mid-twenties and we had just purchased our first home. An odd sort of four bedroom split level not a modern design, though. Something much older, but still described as a split level. We were very intrigued by the way this home was built, the architecture of it. Anyway, in 1997, our daughter was born. Everything seemed to be going really great in our life. And when our daughter turned four years old, she started to talk out loud in her room. She was right at the age where it's really common for a child to invent an imaginary friend, so we figured that's what we were hearing. And then one night I put my daughter to bed. It was right about 8 p.m. And then I went to bed right around 11. I always kept her door open with a nightlight on. That's how she was most comfortable. I would check on her for a time or two before going to bed myself. That was our typical nightly routine. Well, this one night, when I went to peek in on her, her bedroom door was closed. That was odd. I could see the light from the space at the bottom of the door, and I could hear her talking. But something sounded odd. I didn't know if it was just me or not, but something just sounded odd, and I couldn't quite put my finger on it. So I asked my husband to go stand by our daughter's door. Her name is Missy, by the way. Well, he went to Missy's door, and I was standing right behind him as he did. Missy was talking about her doll. She was saying, well, if you don't like this doll, we can play with the other one. My husband decided to open her door to tell her that it's time to stop playing and to go to bed. When he opened the door, she was sound asleep. And we could tell by her breathing that she wasn't faking it and that she'd been in a deep sleep for some time. Missy had five or six different dolls, and every night before bedtime, we would put her dolls in her toy box, and she'd sleep with the stuffed animal that she chose. Well, that night, all of her dolls were out of the toy box, lying on the floor in the middle of her room. Also, in addition to the nightlight being on, a lamp that was on the dresser had been turned on. Everything was out of the ordinary. Walt and I didn't know what to make of any of it. It was strange. We picked up the dolls, turned the lamp off, and left Missy to sleep, leaving the door open. Early the next morning, I went to Missy's room to see if she was up yet. She was still asleep. But I wasn't surprised by that. It was pretty early. What did surprise me was that her dolls were out of the toy box again, lying in the middle of the floor. This happened right around Thanksgiving, so I thought maybe Missy was experiencing holiday excitement. Maybe she was waking up in the middle of the night. Sometimes kids get like that days or sometimes even weeks before Christmas comes. After that, I didn't notice anything unusual for a few weeks. So now we're at the time where we were going to my husband's Christmas party through work. It's an annual event that we always like to attend. My mother was coming to spend the night to watch Missy for us. We went to the party and we got home a little past 1 a.m. The first thing we did when we got back was to go check on Missy. Only she wasn't in her bed. We looked all over the house and we couldn't find her or my mom either. Neither one of them were in our house. We were very alarmed by this. Luckily, Walt found the note in the kitchen letting us know that my mom took Missy to her house. Of course, I was relieved that they were okay, but I thought it was strange that my mom would do that. It was highly irregular. But since it was so late, we would just wait until the following morning. So we went to bed and we would go pick Missy up tomorrow. I woke up to use the bathroom at about 4 a.m. And as I left the bathroom, I saw that Missy's bedroom door was shut. 
I know I left it open. And when I looked, I could see light at the space at the bottom of the door. Now I was a little bit afraid. I thought maybe somebody had intruded. I went and grabbed a hammer from the kitchen, then ran back to Missy's room. When I got to the door, I swore I heard a little girl giggling. I flung that door open so fast, and I saw Missy's dolls were floating midair, about three foot off the floor. They all dropped to the floor at the same time. I screamed and actually fainted. I woke up to my husband splashing a bit of water on my face. He said he heard me scream and then found me lying on the floor in the hallway. He was asking me what happened, and at first I actually couldn't even remember, probably because of fainting. Then just a minute later we heard a giggling sound, then the slamming of a door. We were pretty sure it sounded like it was coming from Missy's room, so we went and opened the door, only to catch sight of her closet door slamming shut. Walt ran to the closet and opened the door, but nothing was there. Then, right behind us, the bedroom door closed. It slammed shut again. We were the only two people in the house. We went to that bedroom door and went to open it, but we couldn't open it. And this door doesn't lock, yet it wouldn't open. We struggled with it and struggled with it. And then a couple of minutes later, it just opened easily. We couldn't make sense out of any of this. So the door is now open and we're looking into an empty hallway and all we could think was, what the hell is going on? After that night, everything was quiet all throughout Christmas and the New Year holiday. Then one night, a couple of weeks after the holidays had passed, I put Missy to bed. Then Walt and I went to bed as usual. After being asleep for a couple of hours, I woke up because I was sure I could hear a child giggling. I got up to check on Missy. I was certain it was her. The door was shut, but other than a nightlight, there didn't appear to be any other lights on in her room. I opened her door very slowly, and I watched as dolls appeared to be moving around by some invisible force. It looked exactly like somebody was playing with them. Now this time I didn't scream or faint. I stood silently and watched for a moment. When I turned a light on, the dolls fell to the floor all at once. Missy was sleeping through all this. So I picked the dolls up and I left her room, taking the dolls with me. I actually put the dolls into the garage. I told Missy nothing. I would come up with something whenever she asked about it. Lucky for me, she was obsessed at that time with coloring, so she didn't make a fuss over taking a break from her dolls. Nothing happened for a couple of months. Then one evening, I was putting Missy to bed when suddenly her closet door started to open up. It actually opened all the way and then slammed shut with great force. Just then, Missy said, Mommy, I don't like her. I asked her, who are you talking about? Who don't you like? Missy said, Joy, I don't like Joy. She went on to say that this Joy is mean to her. She said Joy lives in her closet. And I asked her how she knew that. Well, Missy went to her closet, opened up the door, pushed aside some clothes and other items. And then she pointed to a spot saying, Mommy, she lives in there. She was pointing at the wall. Right at that moment, I actually heard giggling. I didn't know what to think. I was stunned. Missy said, Mommy, like this. And then she put her hand on a portion of the wall inside the closet. And the piece of the wall actually moved inward. Kind of like a doggy door would. I went and I got flashlights. And then Missy and I crawled in to see how far back this went we reached an actual hidden room, a rather large hidden room. It measured roughly 12 foot by eight foot. That's quite a large space to not know about in the home you bought. Inside there was this little tiny child sized chair, a very old dirty teddy bear, and a small raggedy blanket 
It was disintegrating from age. With the flashlights, I saw that there was some writing on the walls. There were several crudely drawn pictures of a house, trees, and people on the wall. It seemed to be drawn with the pencil. I actually woke my husband up to show him this. Walt was as shocked as I was. Shocked that this room existed behind a closet. We had no idea that this was there. And to find it? Well, it was really creepy. We both agreed that Missy should sleep in our room, at least until we figure out why this room is even here. Missy overheard our plan and told me, Mommy, there's a room behind your closet too. I asked her how she knew that. She told me that Joy told her that. Well, we went and pulled everything out of our closet. And we watched as Missy went into our closet, pushed on part of the wall. She knew exactly where to go. She pushed on part of the wall, and just like in her room, the wall moved inward, revealing a room that was similar to the room that was in Missy's closet. It had a small chair, a very old doll, and it also had some scribbles on the wall and pencil. To our horror, we saw chains attached to the chair. We didn't want to think about why anybody would put chains in a room where it was obvious that a child spent time in. We were horrified by what that probably meant. My husband was able to track down the original blueprints for the home, but these rooms were not on the blueprints. So clearly whoever built the home wanted these rooms to be kept secret. We had to decide what to do about this. If not for the giggling and the things I'd seen, that would have been much easier. But we didn't want to make the situation worse. We went about this rather slowly and cautiously. We did want to get rid of these hidden rooms. We thought maybe we could expand the closet space. So a week later, we had a contractor come and look at the closets and the rooms behind them. We also showed him the blueprints that Walt was able to track down. He said these hidden rooms have been very common throughout the years, and it wasn't uncommon at all not to include them on the blueprints. He said he'd seen that quite often. But even he was a bit disturbed by seeing the chains in one of the rooms. He told us what kind of options would be best. We could close them up, putting new sheetrock up and forgetting they're there, or we could utilize the space for storage in a few different ways. He told us to think it over and give him a call back when we decided what we wanted to do. Walt and I talked it over and both of us believed that we were dealing with something paranormal. We know what we saw and we know what we heard. Through a friend, we were able to find somebody who deals with paranormal things. And within a few days, we got a call from a woman named Rosemary. She's a medium, and she said she would pay us a visit. Well, the day that Rosemary came, she said that the moment she arrived, she saw identical twin girls. She told us that the girls had been beaten by their father and neglected by their mother. When they were alive, they would be punished and hidden. They were always made to stay in the rooms behind the closets. They were almost never let out. I was so surprised at how fast Rosemary gave us this information. To the best of my knowledge, she had no prior information. In fact, I was told that Rosemary makes it a practice that nobody tells her anything. She said that it clouds her visions. Anyway, she went on to tell us that both of the girls were there their spirits had been trapped there because they died at four years old. Four years old. They were still babies. Rosemary said that the girls had been hidden, abused, and neglected. They never got medical care, and one of the girls was frequently chained up as a punishment. Rosemary said that nobody in the community knew about them because they were hidden at all times. Not a soul other than the mother and the father, knew these girls existed. Rosemary said that she needed to go into the rooms where this happened. And it was interesting to me that she knew exactly which rooms to go to. 
This was very interesting because of the way our house is designed. It's a very unusual split level, as I've said in the beginning. There were bedrooms on different floors, but Rosemary knew exactly where to go. She went right to the closet in our bedroom and crawled right into the hidden space. The little girls did communicate with Rosemary. One of the twin girls was named Sue. She died inside of this space. She died from starvation and malnutrition. She died chained to that chair. The girl told Rosemary that her father took her body and buried her in the woods. Rosemary then went to Missy's room and crawled into Missy's closet in that hidden space. She told Rosemary her name was Marie, not Joy. We don't know where the name Joy ever came from. Her father strangled her right after her sister died and her body laid in that space for weeks. Then her father buried her in the woods near her sister's burial site. The girls haven't crossed over for several different reasons. Their young age, their terrible lives, the traumatic deaths, and mostly because nobody knew that they had even existed, so nobody knew that they had died. Rosemary did get the girls to cross over with the promise that she would go to the authorities and help them locate the place that they had been buried in. Rosemary told us we needed to get rid of any of the items that were left behind in the spaces. Then to wall up these spaces, she said it was best not to use them. Just put sheetrock up and forget that those spaces even exist. Rosemary said that the twin girls aren't trapped anymore. Their souls are free we wouldn't experience any more paranormal activity. Then Rosemary said that we need to go to the police. We need to tell them about the twin girls and their deaths. I went with Rosemary to the police station. We told them everything that we knew. They were incredulous. They took our statements and then we went with the officers and Rosemary directed them where to go. Rosemary took them to a large wooded area right at the edge of town. Once the police were sure that the area was still within their jurisdiction, we went on and walked into the woods for about 10 minutes. I think they said the distance from the road was a little more than just 2,000 feet. Rosemary showed them exactly where to dig. If any of them had any doubts, that would end very shortly. After digging down less than three feet, they uncovered bags, which contained the remains of the two girls. That's where the police took over. We didn't find out anything until several months later. They did identify the parents of the girls, but both were deceased. The girls died in 1958. We were assured that the girls would be given a proper burial. We did just as Rosemary suggested, we got rid of the chairs and other items, and then we closed up those spaces that were behind the closets. We never did have any more doors opening or closing, no more lights turning on, or dolls being played with. We didn't hear any more giggling after that. It was very quiet. Missy remembers just a little bit about that time. In 2003, we wound up selling the home and moving to another state but I never will forget what happened in that house. My name is Carol, and back in the early 80s, I purchased a home that I absolutely fell in love with. It had the most beautiful wraparound porch. That was one of the things I loved the most about it. It was an extremely spacious four bedroom home. Truth be told, it was much more house than what I needed. Even with my fiance moving in and his daughter, it was still too much house, but we were hoping we would grow into the large home over time. I bought it from an elderly woman who moved into a much smaller home across the street. She said that this home was simply too large for her, and I certainly couldn't argue with that. I couldn't imagine how one person could keep up with such a large home. I didn't blame her one bit for wanting to sell. After getting married, my new husband, Paul, 
and Paul's daughter from a previous relationship moved into the home. At the time, Paul's daughter was only three years old. Her name is Alice. Everything in our lives was going very well. Then one night, Paul woke me up. He looked nervous. He was telling me that someone was in the house. He told me to go to Alice's room and shut the door and try to be quiet. Paul checked the whole house, though, and nobody was there. But Paul was insisting that he heard noises. A month later, Paul woke me again. A similar scenario. Paul telling me he heard noises, saying he even heard the stairs creaking. I went to check on Alice while Paul checked the house. And again, the house was secure. Nobody had broken in. This happened a few more times over the following weeks. And it's not that I didn't believe Paul, but I had to ask why I never heard what he was hearing. Paul said he couldn't really say for sure, but he thought maybe it was because he slept closer to the door. All I knew is that I was tired of getting woken up. One day we went grocery shopping and when we got back home, Paul told me to go ahead and take Alice inside and he'd start bringing the bags in. When he came in the house, he asked me where that odor was coming from. Well, I didn't smell anything, so I had no idea what he was talking about. Paul said that he smelled cigar smoke. He couldn't believe I didn't smell it. He said to him it was a strong odor. And then he also heard a bang that I didn't hear. I didn't know what to make of it. That night, Alice was crying in the middle of the night. Paul ran into her room and found her crying even though she wasn't awake. She must have been having a nightmare. He woke her up to stop her crying. And then when she was settled down and went back to sleep, he returned to bed. The next morning, Paul asked me if when Alice was crying and while he was with her, had I woken up? Had I gone downstairs? I said, no, I didn't. He said, no, I didn't think you had. And then he asked, if you didn't wake up, Carol, why is there a plate, a glass, and a knife in the sink? That sink was totally empty when we went to bed. Of course, this was something that neither of us could explain. Then Paul asked me if I thought it was possible that we could have a ghost. We couldn't explain some of the things that were happening. We had to at least consider that it might be something paranormal going on. I thought it was possible that a ghost could be responsible for sounds and the cigar odor. But I didn't know if a ghost was capable of leaving items in a kitchen sink. Later that day, Paul was asking me if I smelled that cigar odor, but I didn't. He told me to go by the staircase. It was stronger in that area. So I did what he asked. I went to the stairs and I did finally smell it. Well, we looked all over. Nobody was in our house. We couldn't figure out where that smell was coming from. Well, a couple of months went by. Nothing else happened, at least nothing that we noticed. There were no unusual sounds or odors. Then suddenly one morning, Paul asked me, if I had the middle of the night munchies. Well, I was about four months pregnant at the time, so I didn't think it was an odd question. But I told Paul, no, I slept soundly the night before. I didn't wake up for any reason. Paul said, no, I didn't think you had. I didn't hear or feel you move. I didn't think you had gotten up. When I went down to the kitchen, I saw why Paul asked me that. On the counter, there was a loaf of bread left out a plate with a mostly eaten sandwich and a glass of milk with just a little bit left in it. When Paul came into the kitchen, he very seriously said to me, Carol, somebody had to be in this house. We have to figure out what's going on here. I was definitely beginning to see his point, but we talked about how many times we've checked and found nothing. Then after that, nothing else strange occurred, at least not until I had the baby. The evening I got home from the hospital with the baby, well, I was exhausted, I was sore. 
I didn't want to walk up the steps that night. So I had Paul put the bassinet in the den, and I slept on the couch. That night, I heard someone in the kitchen. I heard cabinets being opened and closed, the refrigerator door opening and closing. I heard footsteps. I heard the footsteps coming towards the den. So I pretended to be asleep, and I was terrified. It was just me and the baby. Then I began to smell cigar smoke. I heard someone walk into the den, then walk out. But it felt like they didn't really leave. I didn't open my eyes. I was still pretending to be asleep. But it felt like they were still in the doorway, watching me. And oh my God, I was right. After nearly five minutes, I heard the door to the den close. I didn't know what to do. I was in no condition to run up the stairs for Paul. I was clearly in a weakened physical condition due to childbirth. I suddenly remembered that the den actually had a lock on the door. So I got up, and as quietly as I could, I turned the lock. In the morning, Paul was knocking on the door, asking if I was okay, asking me why I had locked the door. I explained everything that I experienced the previous night. Paul said that night he'd make sure that the baby and I got upstairs, and then at night he would sleep in a chair right by our bedroom door, which he did. I must have been in a really deep sleep. I didn't hear a thing until Paul was carrying Alice into our room, and I could hear sirens in the distance. Paul told me to lock the door as soon as he left. He said, Carol, somebody is in this house. The police came and they searched, but just like all the times we searched, they didn't find anyone. They didn't find a thing. As we were speaking to the police, we suddenly heard somebody yelling. We couldn't tell exactly what they were saying, but we heard some yelling. It was coming, or at least it seemed like it was coming, from the closet under the stairs. We all heard it. Two cops went to the closet door and they opened it. Everyone was so quiet, you could have heard a pin drop. One of the cops bent down and started moving a box out of the way, and then he began to push on the closet walls. A small section of drywall fell over onto the floor. The cop took a peek inside and asked if we knew that there was a ladder in there. Of course we didn't. The cop went down the ladder with the flashlight. When he got down to the bottom, he yelled for my husband to climb down. Down at the bottom, there were ashtrays filled with cigars, a ton of empty beer bottles, and a gallon jug that looked like it held urine. Then there was a hole in one of the walls down there. The cop went through that hole and came to a small room. The room had a ladder in it that he had to climb up. Once up that ladder, he came to some kind of little overhead trapdoor and he wound up in somebody's yard, almost standing directly in front of a back door. The cop began banging on the door. An elderly woman answered the door. The woman looked old and frail. The officer asked her if she lived alone and she said no, her son lived with her and he's in his room asleep. They went in and brought the man out in handcuffs. This 48 year old man who lived with his 80 year old mother had been coming into our home whenever he felt like it. When we heard the yelling, that was him trying to get out in a hurry because he knew the cops were there. The elderly woman was the person we bought our home from. She knew that the two homes were connected this way, but never told us. We had no idea that these rooms even existed. We had to bring in a contractor to dig up the yard and fill that big tunnel with yards and yards of concrete. We wanted to make sure that if anybody ever tried to do this again, they'd have to go through an awful lot to get from one house to the other. And if anybody was ambitious enough to do that, well, we would surely hear them. We did press charges against the son, but asked that the 80 year old woman not be involved. Although she should have told us, we don't think she had anything to do with her son's actions. 
The man said that he didn't mean any harm, that he never would have hurt anybody. He really didn't mean any ill intentions towards us. He said that he was curious about the people who bought the house from his mother. Paul told him, that's what front doors are for. He could have just knocked and met us. In the end, the man just got a slap on the wrist with time served and probation. We got an alarm system and a hefty bill for the concrete and a crazy story to tell. All signs in the beginning pointed to this being something paranormal, yet it wasn't. The most important thing is that nothing tragic happened and we're all okay. Okay guys, that's all I've got for now. But you know I'll be back really soon with more stories. Do me a favor and hit that like button before you leave and keep those comments coming. You know how much I love them. Until the next time, everybody stay safe and keep your eye out for the scary and the strange. All right, bye for now, everybody. Take care.